Um, Emerson Boyer. Um, Emerson is currently assistant curator of European Sculpture and Decorative Art at the Met and the Metropolitan Museum. Um, he's previously worked at the Frick and the Fine Arts Museum, uh, Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. Um, many exhibitions to name, uh, just to name one, Luminous World, British Works on Paper, 1760 to 1900. He also recently completed his dissertation here um, called Numismatic Identity. And in 2012, he edited and introduced a special issue of the journal Grey Room devoted to 19th century technology and reproduction. Currently working on the question of color in sculpture. Hi, and thank you so much to, to Maggie for having me today. It's a real joy to be, to be back on my old turf. <laughs> um, on April 7, 1824, the young Eugène Delacroix wrote in his journal, I must draw many men of my time, many medals for the sake of the nude. And by medals he meant ancient coins. This passage is remarkable for its conjunction of apparently contradictory subjects, the contemporary and the antique, nature and classicism, the living figure and the inanimate object. Here is an artist at the crossroads of Romanticism and the classical tradition, an artist who, for the moment at least, can envisage the usefulness of both. The next year, Delacroix completed his first major endeavor in print media, a series of lithographs depicting ancient Greek coins. Published by Engelmann, the images joined antiquity and the newly invented technology of lithography. Although there may have originally been six prints in Delacroix's series, today examples exist of only five. The works were produced as a speculative endeavor, but largely failed to sell and were unmentioned by critics until the mid-1850s. Perhaps the first discussion of the prints came from Tayfield Sylvester, who made the grand claim that these lithographs, now very rare, provide the key to Delacroix's oeuvre. Superficially, the prints belong to the well-established tradition of numismatic illustration. From the Renaissance onward, engravings of coins typically accompanied numismatic treatises and catalogues. Their format derived from the publications of Aeneo Vico, such as his 1553 Omnium Caesarum. Here, the reverses of imperial Roman coins are pictured in groups on separate pages. Each, is, each group is arranged in a grid-like formation and set against a densely gridded background, the latter suggesting a textured surface, like velvet perhaps. Vico's pages replicate collector's trays, or tabulae, still today the most common form of storage and display of numismatic objects. Each page functions as a shallow, box-like space. It offers the fantasy of bodily engagement with the representation of the touching, handling, sliding, and positioning of the objects by hand. But at the same time, the very materiality of Vico's coins is neutralized by the blank paper, drained of three-dimensionality and intrinsic value. The prints excise the, the idiosyncratic qualities of the objects themselves. Instead, Vico's linear diagrammatic images present idealized specimens or types in regular sizes emphasizing the seriality that was so crucial for their scholarly function as chronological chains of historical personages and events. In other words, Vico's pages oscillate uncertainly between tactile and visual perception. Just what it is that constitutes their value is ambiguous. Humanist scholars from the 15th to the mid 18th centuries were primarily concerned with the inscriptions on coins and medals. The material composition of the objects was largely disregarded, and while images were recorded, it was for their iconography rather than their style or aesthetic qualities. Considering the textual preoccupations of numismatists, it is little wonder that the graphic illustration of coins and medals moved toward greater and greater abstraction. Vico's conceit of the tabulae soon disappeared, and the linear, disembodied images of coins and medals began to be imprinted on entirely blank pages. Tellingly, the most ambitious and influential numismatic catalogue of the late 18th century, Joseph Eccles' eight-volume Doctrina Numorum Veterum, contained almost no illustrations. 
it effectively converted each coin into pure text. Delacroix's prints, by contrast, are standalone objects, unaccompanied by texts or even identifications of the depicted coins. They seek the status of artworks in their own right, as indicated by the florid signatures inscribed on each sheet. Instead of diagrams, Delacroix's lithographic images present us with things, rough, irregular relief objects that often nestle against one another, their edges sometimes overlapping, sometimes merging like bodily cells. Thick and dense, some cast shadows on an indeterminate ground, others pile up vertically atop each other. Some even dissolve at their extremities, absorbed by or submerged within the blank paper. Despite the ambiguity and often contradictory spatial status of the objects in each print, they exude a quality of nearness, of palpability, of being within reach. For Charles Blanc, writing in 1834, the prints were too material, too real, and he described them as coarse reliefs hewn by a shepherd's knife. With a feverish hand, he wrote, Delacroix has tra transgressed the lines, displaced the lights, confused the shadows, and transformed these coins, which are worth a thousand times their weight in gold, into effigies struck from the dyes of barbarians. For Blanc, Delacroix had not delivered the pristine, perfect bodies expected of the illustrious ancients. Instead, the artist had presented something altogether more primitive and irrational. In, to take the central coin in studies of 12 Greek coins, for example. There, facial elements are entirely disconnected. Lips, eyes, chins, cheeks, each is radically discontinuous from its neighboring flesh and muscle. The famous Greek naturalism, so visible in the newly celebrated um, Elgin marbles, is noticeably absent from these depictions, which seem to anticipate Baudelaire's later evocation of sculpture, sculpture's fundamental otherness. The origin of sculpture, he wrote, is lost in the night of time. It must therefore be an art of the Caribbees. And sure enough, we find all races carving fetishes very skillfully long before they tackle painting. Since Théophile Sylvester, a number of art historians have recognized in the prints the first coherent expression of Delacroix's radical and unique approach to drawing. Technically, the lithographs are utterly removed from the tradition of drawing a la bosse, where emphasis was placed on contour and subtly graded interior modeling. In 1864, Sylvester described this departure from accepted practice by comparing the artist to anger. Delacroix's drawing, he wrote, is to anger as, as fire is to ice. Anger is so concerned with the contours of objects that he is always shaken by their loss. This makes his modeling flat and faded like a geometric design or architectural wash. Delacroix, on the contrary, is absolutely committed to the embodiment of relief in the forms it produces. For him, contour seems to establish itself without the artist needing to invent it. That which is inside the container determines the shape and measure of the container itself. Delacroix justified this drawing system, continued Sylvester, by his analysis of antique metals, modeled by their masses or centers. When our modern current currencies are worn down by friction, you can't see any design on them because they are made from the standpoint of external contours, from the silhouette, while antique coins remain beautiful and three-dimensional, having been made from the very different standpoint of volumes or interior masses. Now what Delacroix demonstrates in his coin imagery, then, is the primacy of matter. The drawings themselves continually betray the material process of their production. Broad, heavy strokes, thick hatching and cross-hatching, scribbles here and there, even moments where the artist is scraped back into the waxy surface to reveal the stone underneath. Joyce Howell has made the astute observation that throughout the coin lithographs, Delacroix's, Delacroix's tone is the inverse of what would imitate the fall of light and reverse the normal assignment of lights for highlights and darks for shadows. This, it seems to me, 
should be related to what is perhaps the most physical technique for drawing an object, that is frottage. This age-old procedure for the accurate copying of relief or incised surfaces was often used by antiquarians and archaeologists and presented the fastest way to record the surface of an object or element of architecture. Obtained by rubbing charcoal or pencil over a thin sheet of paper pressed against the desired surface, such images exhibited exactly the kind of distribution of lights and darks that Hal describes. So if Anger's drawings, and his tracings especially, sought distilled purity of line, then Delacroix's grasped the messy, individualized reality of the material world. Delacroix's lithographs insist on the singularity of each depicted coins, edges nicked and broken, holes punched through metal, inscriptions idiosyncratically worn down. Discussing the prints in 1895, Leon Rosenthal was even moved to imagine life histories of the objects and the means by which they might have attained their present appearances. These are not new coins, he wrote, preciously preserved in a cabinet. In the markets of Athens, they bought olives and the anchovies of Pontus. On the roads of Asia, Mithridates shed them to tempt the greed of the Roman soldiers sent in his pursuit. They weighed in the balance of Gallic bran or jingled in the purse of Judas. Individuality, however, was not merely the product of the accretion of time. From their moment of production, no two Greek coins were exactly alike. Difference was inscribed with every blow of the minter's hammer, just as much as repetition. Some coins were only half struck or the design impressed slightly off the edges of the metal. Others were double struck, cracked or pushed out of shape. Precisely the opposite of the kinds of coins that were being produced in Delacroix's era, um, particularly with new technologies developed by um, Bolton in England especially. So what we have then is not a drachma, but this drachma. For many theorists of money, past and present, such a distinction should not be possible. Georg Simmel, to take a representative example, claimed that the essential characteristic of money was its unconditional interchangeability the internal uniformity that makes each piece exchangeable for another. The result, for Simmel and others, is money's neutrality and transparency. This characterization enables the telling, his telling of what has become a powerful narrative of dematerialization of monetary forms. Scholars from various disciplines have questioned this narrative. As Rebecca Spang has noted, if the idea of money as a dematerialized general equivalent describes the theory of money very well, it only inadequately maps monetary practices in an era. Until the demise of the gold standard, coins were clipped, bitten, bent, defaced, worn down, even melted down, and different monies were used for specific purposes and in particular circumstances. In a now famous passage from Capital, Marx described the all-important velocity of money, its restless currency, and the function it performs as a perpetual mobile of circulation. However, Marx noted, so soon as the series of metamorphoses is interrupted, so soon as sales are not supplemented by subsequent purchases, money ceases to be mobilized. It is this halting of movement, this inability to function correctly, that renders money visible and allows it to be studied closely. Marx describes coins that have been taken out of circulation as petrified and associates them with the practice of hoarding. Today, the hoard is also known as an archaeological term for a buried deposit of old coins. Hoard seems an appropriate term for Delacroix's groups of ancient coins. Three years after his coin lithographs, the artist would produce a more shocking image of hoarding, the death of Sardanapalus. In this enormous work, the decadent last king of Assyria is depicted on a funeral pyre, floating on a sea of glittering and fleshly possessions. These, including his slaves, are to be kept with him in death. Here, hoarding and suicide are joined, two sides of the same dysfunctional coin. In terms of their intended function, Delacroix's coins have come to a standstill. They are demonetized. 
France, of course, had a traumatic relationship with monetization, demonetization. A multiplicity of currencies had moved in and out of cir circulation since the revolution, the most infamous being the 1719, 1796 withdrawal, withdrawal of the Assigne from monetary use. In the 1820s, there was much debate concerning the problem of old regime currency. Despite the irreversible rise of the franc, ECU continued to function as money in many parts of the country. Although less visible in Paris, old regime money was frequently used in the provinces during this period. In other words, what was an artifact in Paris was very much functional outside the city. With demonetization comes a certain obsolescence. There is a fascinating similarity between Delacroix's compositions and the odd genre of trompe l'oeil prints picturing Assignac that emerged in the years around 1800. Produced in the wake of the withdrawal of paper currency from circulation in 1796, these prints show multiple assignats, seem seemingly casually arrayed across an indeterminate surface. Torn, fox-eared, curling up at the corners, these are the wreckage of the revolution, the flotsam and jetsam of a supposedly completed historical moment. Reproduced as saleable prints, the otherwise worthless assignat re-enter circulation but only as ghosts. In the sixth of Sir Joshua Reynolds' Discourses on Art, the venerable academician exclaimed the following, we must trace, art, trace back the art to its fountainhead, the monuments of pure antiquity. All the inventions and thoughts of the ancients, whether conveyed to us in statues, bas-reliefs, intaglios, cameos, or coins, are to be sought after and carefully studied. The genius that hovers over these venerable relics may be called the father of modern art. Now, for Delacroix in 1824, 1825, the fountainhead was specifically Greek. At that time, debate raged around the problem of ancient Greek art. What was properly Greek and what was a Roman copy? What works exemplified the per perfection of Greek art? Delacroix would have been aware of the contemporary controversy surrounding two major acquisitions, the Venus de Milo at the Louvre and the Elgin Marbles at the British Museum. In essence, the real question asked by all participants was, what is classicism? Delacroix was a frequent visitor to the Louvre, where he copied antiquities. In mid-1825, he visited London and sketched the Elgin Marbles, and was so drawn to one metope that he made a lithograph after it upon his return to Paris. Delacroix was simultaneously engaged with the problem of contemporary Greece. As early as 1821, he had considered painting a subject from the Greek War of Independence, and in 1823, decided to begin work depicting the 1822 massacres of the town of Chios. The Turkish occupation of Greece and the destruction wrought by war during that period seemed to have brought low a culture that was once the pinnacle of civilization. There is a related sense of decay about Delacroix's lithograph coins. For Andreas Hoysen, ruins and the concept of authenticity are not only central topoi of modernity, but they are inextricably bound. Romantic ruins, he writes, guaranteed orange origins and promised authenticity, immediacy, and authority. However, there is a paradox. In the case of ruins, that which is allegedly present and transparent whenever authenticity is claimed, is present only as an absence. It is the imagined presence, present of a past that can now only be grasped in its decay. Delacroix's prints offer the promise of the tangible presence of ancient Greece, access to the fountainhead, as Reynolds put it. But not only are the depicted coins ruined, the original objects themselves are absent. What remains is, quite literally, an impression pulled from the lithographic apparatus. What then of the original objects, the models from which Delacroix made his lithographs? There has been much debate concerning the specific sources for the depicted coins. Recent scholarship has confirmed that each depicted coin corresponds specifically with an example in the collection of the Cabinet de Médailles in Paris. However, the evidence suggests that Delacroix used sulfur casts of those coins. Between 1799 and 1816, um, 
Teodor Edme Mione, a curator at the Cabinet, had produced sulfur casts of some 20,000 ancient Greek, Greek and Roman coins from the museum's collection. They had a wide circulation even beyond the borders of France. In 1808, for example, Goethe recorded the following in his journal. Mionet's invaluable casts of Greek coins had arrived. You here look into an abyss of the past and were astonished at the most splendid pictures. The process of sulfur casting was not new, but this mass production of a major public collection was unprecedented. Sulfur casts were considered superior to those in plaster. This is because they copied not simply the, sur the separate surfaces of a coin, but simulated the double-sided object itself. The plaster cast of a coin, on the other hand, would result in two distinct casts. This meant that one could hold and turn over a sulfur cast as one would the original object, and they were often tinted, like these, to imitate various metallic um, media. Delacroix chose the newest available medium for the depiction and reproduction of his images, lithography. In 1825, this process was well known, but still considered a recent invention. Delacroix had already worked with the process, but not in a sustained manner. Somewhat paradoxically for a reproduction technology, lithography was celebrated for its production of authenticity. The critic Francois Mille, for example, claimed that lithographic prints were original works of art. The artist, he wrote, makes a drawing on a stone. The stone performs the role of an engraving plate. The impression on the paper is the drawing itself, reflected in the counterproof, like in a mirror. The print is, so to speak, autographic. It is from the hand of the master. It does not differ from the original. It is itself an original. With his prints, Delacroix seems to play with this idea of the counterproof, or mirror reflection. Sheet of antique coins, for example, the image on the left, is constructed according to an internal logic of reversibility. Only profile heads are pictured, some look right, others left. In the center of the sheet is a Janus-like head, its symmetry structuring the entire composition. But as much as it speaks of doubling, it also proclaims difference. The conjoined faces are of different genders. By the early 1820s, lithography seemed to be the only medium that could match the pace of modernity. It was particularly associated with the speed and ephemerality of political events and everyday life. Perhaps the most insightful commentator on the new process was Adolf Thier, who in a series of essays published in 1824 praised the veritable revolution of lithography. For him, the technology allowed artists to fling on the stone any idea that struck them, to fix all the images that crossed their mind, to grasp all the fugitive elements offered to them by nature. Given its association with the contemporary and the ephemeral, Delacroix's decision to use the medium for his images of antiquities seems counterproductive, or counterintuitive. In the early 1820s, the reproduction of high art in lithographic form was comparatively rare. Thiers strongly counseled against it, arguing, arguing that the medium was fundamentally incompatible with such images. For him, the triumph of the medium resided in the ebauche, or rough sketch. It provided artists with the ability to improvise. This was the authenticity promised by lithography. Later in his career, Delacroix criticized the academic attachment to a small pool of, academic mo of ancient models. The students of certain schools, he wrote, have done nothing but endlessly repeat the same forms. They have not imitated, but cast from the antique. The Antinous, the Venus, the Gladiator, etc., are the types they reproduce with, so to speak, closed eyes. Reproduction, Delacroix astutely observed, is the very logic of academic classicism, the unceasing return to origins. But while his Greek coins were copies of copies of copies, Delacroix emphasized their unruly idiosync idiosyncrasy, a singularity that was both extended and problematized by his deployment of the lithographic medium, one that seemed to produce original copies. His coins are sites of multiple tensions and seeming contradictions. They engage simultaneously with absence and presence, obsolescence and creativity, with circulation and intransigence, with image and object. Rather than finding the abstract classical ideal, he found primitive materiality. 
Perhaps this is what Sylvester meant when he identified the prince as the key to Delacroix's oeuvre. Thank you.